This is the Darren Paltrow cast with Darren Paltrowitz. I've been interviewing musicians, comedians, and all sorts of entertainers for almost 20 years. Joan Rivers, Flavor Flav, Paris Hilton, members of Guns N' Roses and the Eagles, and countless others. This show is about artists and why they do what they do. On this edition of the Paltrowcast, we have interviews with five different people. Legendary singer Dionne Warwick, Grand Funk Railroad and Bob Seger drummer Don Brewer, E Street Band guitarist and soul artist Nils Lofgren, 311 singer and guitarist Nick Hexham, and Chef and Netflix Nailed It star Jacques Torres. We'll be going back to the three guest episodes on the next episode, so let's just think of this one as a special edition of the show. First up is my chat with Dionne Warwick. She's back as Ms. Warwick's first new album in five years, and it came out on May 10th. It was produced by her son Damon Elliott, and it was released through his record label Kind Music in cooperation with Entertainment One. We talked about She's Back, New Jersey, and plenty more within our chat. Hi, Aaron. It's Dionne Warwick. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I first want to ask you about the new album, She's Back. Uh, how long had mm-hmm. you been making it for? Oh, it's been about two months. And did you know all those songs were going to be done, or were some of it written in the studio? No, no. All those songs were uh, presented to me to listen to, and uh, I made my choice as to what I wanted to sing, as I always have. And um, that's how we created the CD. And do you have a favorite song from the album? Oh, no, I don't. They're all very, very, very pop. I loved every single one of them that I recorded. And I understand that you're going to be doing a Vegas residency in the near future. Will you be performing a lot of songs from She's Back on that residency as part of those shows? Well, during the course of the residency, of course I will. Understood. So what else will you be performing? Will it be a career retrospective or more focused on a particular era of your career? You know, there, there is no era of my career. I think I still have a lot of more to go. <laughs> But I will be doing songs that people are expecting to hear from me. I don't think there's a time that I can walk on any stage without doing walk on by or I say a little prayer or don't make me over. You know, these are songs that people grew with me and I hope came to love as much as I did. And you you just made a very good point where you said there isn't a particular era of your career. There's still a lot more to do. Are there particular genres or styles that you haven't done that you still hope to? No, I've, I've been put into a multitude of categories that, uh, that people like to kind of pigeonhole you into. So uh, and that's the fortunate thing about Dionne Warwick and, and the, the recordings I've made. You cannot pigeonhole them. Um, you can't put me in a box. You know, I, I, I have enjoyed the freedom of bringing music to people's ears, and that's what I continue to do. And of course, you've been very influential to many of the biggest artists of all time. Do you like to do duets? Oh, I love it. It's so wonderful to to interchange with, uh, especially people who are musical, really, really musical. And uh, as is evidenced on on the new CD, I did a a few duets that I'm very proud of, one with a, a young man I met for the first time, uh, when we walked in the studio to record together, his name is Music Soul Child. Uh, he's of the the youthful era right now. Um, I did a wonderful duet with Brian McKnight, uh, and another one with uh, one of my babies. I call him my baby because I watched his career grow, Kenny Lattimore. So you know the, the CD is full of some wonderful, wonderful music. And beyond the music, is there something that you wish more people knew about you in general? No, I think people know enough about me or as much as they should know about me. Well, I ask that because, you know, some people who have been famous for decades upon decades, they have a hobby outside of their main career that that's what they really wish more people knew about them. Do you have anything besides music that you're very active in? Absolutely. I have an interior design company. I have a uh, skincare line. I have fragrance. 
So, you know, but I do a lot of things, the things that uh, interest me. Well, when was it that you realized that you could do more than just music? Because when you started, people were just a musician, they were just an actress. But now that you have all these different companies and projects, when was mm-hmm. it re- that you realized that you could do all these things at the same time? Well, actually, what I was going to do uh, from the very beginning, I was going to teach. That's what my credentials have me given me the ability to do. That's why I went to college. Um, finding the other thing of interest, I think, stems from being around people who had that ability to do those things. Oh, that sounds like something I'd like to do. You know, and I think every little girl in the world has at one time or another wanted to repaint her bedroom or move her furniture around and things of that nature. And that was no different. Right. So I find it very admirable that you've always continually worked every single year, that your career never slowed down. Was that the product of having good management or was it just coincidence and you never stopped and you never made plans? No, it had to do with uh, me doing what I happen to love to do. And uh, singing is as much a part of my life as my life itself. So I'm doing something that is enjoyable not only to me, apparently it's become enjoyable to a multitude of people. So another way that your name recently came up was from the show Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Was that something that was on your radar that you've heard a lot about? The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt? Uh, he just dumped me. <laughs> That's a show I don't know anything about, I don't think. Oh, it was a Netflix show created by Tina Fey where your name was said a lot by one particular character that he was your understudy. It's a comedy show that's been popular the last two or three years that I think just ended. Oh. Well, I, I never saw it, so I, I'm, I'm not familiar with a character being created around my, my name. So, you know, God bless whoever it is that's keeping my name alive. <laughs> noted, noted. So, <laughs> ultimately... Is there a career accomplishment that you are most proud of at this point, or is really the biggest accomplishment the fact that you're still doing it at a high level? Uh, Well, being able to continue to do what I do, as I said before, I love what I do. We knew that I never wanted to work. You know, I never wanted a job, a real job. So when this becomes what I term to be a work or a job, that's when Dion will say goodbye. I had a good time. I hope you did too. You know, uh, that I happen to love what I do and it's, it's, um, it's fulfilling to me and hopefully to those who attend any of my concerts or have seen me perform in the past or have, have uh, purchased my recordings that they become fulfilled as well. Sure. And then another thing that I find very interesting is when I look at your Instagram account, you have a lot of interesting classic photos from your career of you with Tom Jones and you with, I think it was Barry Gordy in one of the photos at a cake. Do you have a huge archive of great photos that you've been keeping all these years? All those photos uh, are in the hands of those who keep those things now called social media and that kind of stuff going on. I don't have a clue as to how to do that. My my niece and, and my, my public relations people are the ones who do all of that. So anything that you're seeing on social media is them keeping you up to speed on it. <laughs> Got it. That makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. And two last questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the first is, mm-hmm. you were from New Jersey before it was cool to be from New Jersey. Did you always have hometown pride about being from Orange? Absolutely. Positively. As a matter of fact, I was just informed by the um, New Jersey Hall of Fame that uh, my photograph now hangs in Terminal A in New York Airport. And it's wonderful to be from New Jersey, along with so many other iconic figures. You know, the Yogi Berra, um, there's um, Connie Chung, um, Thomas Edison, how about that? (laughs) You know, there are many, many people who come from New Jersey and have sense of pride about it, and I happen to be one of those. So in closing, any last words for the kids? Yeah. Um... I have a new CD called She's Back. I think you're going to enjoy it. So make sure that you put that in your repertoire of recordings. And, uh, you know, just 
If you have a, a, a dream, follow it. Next up are highlights from my chat with Grand Funk Railroad drummer Dom Brewer. This summer, Dom will be doing double duty on tour as he plays with both Grand Funk and Bob Seger on select evenings. As discussed with Don, there are no plans for him to slow down as a musician anytime soon, even though he loves life in Jupiter, Florida. The current lineup of Grand Funk has been in place for a couple of decades. Uh, are there any plans to record an album or at least some new music with the lineup? Uh, you know, we've we've been doing new stuff now for uh, the past 19 years uh, with the band, and we've got a lot of stuff that's in you know that we we've got in the can that we've done live, and so it, at some point possibly. Uh, we would do a uh, possibly a live, um, a live. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know if you can even call them uh, CDs anymore. So, <laughs> a live uh, recording uh, that would include some new stuff, right? So, you yourself have been writing all these years, whether or not the music has been coming out. I take it. That's true. You know, uh, you know, and, and Max is also a writer. Uh, Bruce, Bruce writes. Uh, you know, so we we've got some great so- uh, songwriters in the band. Actually, Tim, uh, the keyboard player, does some writing as well. Interesting. So the intro to We're an American Band, a lot of people think that it's one of the greatest drum licks ever recorded. Was that something that you came up with yourself or is that especially for the song? Well, we were looking, you know, I, I brought the song, actually, We're an American Band, into a rehearsal for Grand Funk. And, and I wrote the song around the, uh, the line, we're coming to your town, we'll help you party it down. Uh, going through a whole lot of lawsuits and everything else at the time, and radio was changing from being uh, FM underground to being a hit format. So we needed to come up with hit hit material, you know, three minute three minute long kind of stuff. And one day in rehearsal, uh, you know, we came up with the idea of using a cowbell at the beginning of the song, you know, and uh, you know, I always played like a double kind of a bass drum, but it was on a single a single drum, you know, single bass drum. And, uh, you know, that was my thing to do that kick kind of a thing, you know, and came up with that, uh, that intro for the song. Uh, and really that came later, uh, as we had, we had pretty much finished working out the arrangement for the song, but, you know, we added on to the, the cowbell, Hey, we need a cowbell at the beginning of this. So you were doing cowbell way before it was cool. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> before, before the line, more cowbell came about. <laughs> exactly. Well, going back to that era, uh, the Shea Stadium footage is very, very, very popular, yet the entirety of what was filmed has not come out. Is there any chance it still might come out, the whole Shea film? No, oh, there's a possibility. You know, it's uh, the Maisel brothers did that, and we've got that whole thing, uh, you know, in the can, as they call it. Uh, I don't know if it's, a, it's a, you know, at what point it would ever come out, but yes, there's a possibility it would come out. Well, in general, is there a lot of material from over the years in the vault, things that you're hoping might come out one day? Not really. Uh, there is, is, you know, pretty much everything that um, is worth putting out there uh, is out there, except for the Shea Stadium footage, really. I mean, that's and, and there are bits and pieces of that out there now. Well, in terms of the Shea material, is the hold up more the label or is it the director state entirely? You know, there's really not, you know, not a, uh, a distinct reason for not releasing it. It's just, uh, you know, it hasn't come to time yet. You know, it, hasn't, it hasn't, hasn't really presented the right time. So in terms of you and your legacy, you know, Grand Funk is considered one of the most popular bands of all time, one of the, the greatest bands of all time. But is there an accomplishment that you're most proud of personally? Yeah, my daughter. So, so the most popular or most uh, important accomplishment has nothing to do with your music, in other words. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say so. I, I'm, my daughter and my family, I, I'm, I'm the most proud of that. Yes, absolutely. Well, when exactly did that realization come about? Because, of course, when people you know, decide that they're going to be professional artists, obviously the eye is on the prize with that uh, at the beginning. Well, you know, I've always uh, I've always pursued music ever since I can remember uh, seeing Elvis Presley on on the Ed Sullivan Show doing Blue Suede Shoes. You know that that's always been my dream uh, was to be involved in rock and roll, and I, I've I've had the I've had the good fortune uh, to live uh, you know my dream really, uh, and to to I'm 70 years old and I've been able to do uh, what I love my whole entire life. Uh, but like I said, you know, I mean, um, you know, my family is probably the most important thing to me. That makes sense. Uh, so is there anything that you have an accomplishment, uh, that you're still hoping to accomplish one day? 
<laughs> well, yes, I'd like to, uh, I, I want to fly a plane by myself. I, you know, I, I, I've always had a dream to, uh, to be a pilot. And uh, at some point, I'm going to take the time and, uh, and do that. Uh, you know, and I, be- I better hurry up because <laughs> I don't know if you can still get a license at the age of 80. So um, it, it's going to come pretty quick. You do a lot of work related to animal rescue. When did you first get interested in that area? Yeah, my wife and I uh, have done that for you know quite a number of, a number of years, about twenty or thirty years now. And we live in Jupiter, Florida. And my wife is a former uh, radio personality down here, and uh, and she got involved with Safe Harbor, which is a no kill animal f- facility here in Jupiter, Florida. And we've been involved uh, with that uh, for you know, a, a lot of years. And and we're just you know we're just major animal lovers. That's that's what we do. We always rescue animals and uh, have them in the house and. Uh, my wife has got a, a little ranch out west of uh, Jupiter now that she uh, has actually uh, rescued a couple of horses. So um, you know we're we're doing uh, doing that kind of stuff, and it, it's just uh, it's just what we love. Was the decision to move to Jupiter a response to the Michigan cold for all those years? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I came to I came to Florida actually. Uh, first first stop was Boca Raton. Uh, that was back in 1980. And, uh, yes, it was, uh, definite, uh, I'm not a cold weather person. But your friend, Bob Seeger, from what I hear is still a cold weather person all these years later. Is that the case? As far as I know. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he still, li- he still lives in Michigan. Well, asking uh, about Bob for a second here, you're playing in grand funk is much more virtuoso like than you're playing with Bob where you have to be more in the pocket. Is that something that you had to train yourself to do to be in the background more? Well, you know, it's just two different styles of playing. You know, when I, when I play uh, grand funk music, I'm playing parts that I wrote. I conceived, I, you know, I came up with them. They, they're basically a part of me. Uh, to play for Bob or to play for any other band, you know, where you're playing somebody else's material, uh, you have to, you know, think out the outside the box and you're not playing within your comfort zone all the time. And so, yes, you have to, to kind of train yourself. Gee, I, I'm, you know, I'm playing what this guy played and I'm playing what Bob wrote. Uh, but I, you know, I'm going to still, you know, have to play the way I play. And so you incorporate a little bit of yourself into it, but you're, you're always keeping in mind that, uh, you are trying to, you know, to capture, um, another moment in another uh, in another place you know uh, so uh, that it, you know it, it's kind of it's reaching it's really good for uh, musicians to do that too you know i mean I, I think it's really kind of thinking outside the box when it comes to your writing itself do you play other instruments or are you able to sing the melody independently while playing drums yeah i, I you know i can i come up with the stuff in my head and i can sing it and i can sing parts in my head what the bass part should be, what the guitar part should be, what the, the keyboard part should be. I can play very little guitar. I can play a few chords on a guitar. I can play very little on a piano, but I can, you know, I can play enough to, to get my ideas across between that and singing. You know, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I've uh, read and heard things about Michael Jackson that he, he did all of the stuff uh, for his, uh, his recordings. Uh, you know, he came up with all of the parts uh, in his head and, and singing the parts. So your ability to do all of that at the same time, when did you first realize that you heard music in your head? <laughs> so, since the very first time I played, you know, I mean, I, I always would hear music in my head. You know, you always, uh, you, you hear a song and it, it'll stick with you for a couple of days, you know, and then all of a sudden you, you go off on another tangent and you find something that you come up with in your head and you just, you know, you sing that to yourself for a few days and, uh, yeah, it just... It, it, it's just a naturally occurring experience. I think it happens to most people that uh, that write music. How often do you write? Is it something that you have to sit down to do, or something that just comes to you naturally? Well, both. You know, I mean, you if you're looking for something, if you feel that like you need to come up with something, you know, that's one way to approach it. And the other way is, you know, you're just driving down the road one day, and all of a sudden a, a melody comes to mind, and you kind of go with it, you know, in your head. So. Uh, uh, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of guys, you know, that they, they carry a recorder with them all the time. And now with iPhones and all that stuff, you know, you can constantly record stuff and put parts together and then edit them together later. And, uh, you know, this would make a great bridge. This would make a great lyric. This would make a great verse. This would make a great, uh, chorus, you know, and, and you put the parts together. Interesting. So were more of your successful songs that you wrote or co-wrote 
songs that came to you on the fly or were they things there you said, okay, we got an album due, I have to write? Yeah, both. You know, you, you really, you know, it, com- it comes from both. You know, you, you have to sit down and come up with stuff. And uh, if you're under the gun, you know, that, that, that happens. And then there's other times when it's just, it just, it just comes to you. And then way aside from all that, my friend wanted me to ask if there was any chance that the recordings that you did with the band Flint might be re-released one day. You know, I have no idea. I, I kind of doubt it. You know, I think they're out there. I think you can find them if you dig far, dig deep enough. But um, I don't think there's any record companies that are uh, um, interested in re-releasing that stuff. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, I'm, I've got it. I've got it here. <laughs> I've got the recordings here. <laughs> got it. Uh, so in closing, any last words for the kids? Oh, just, you know, anybody that wants to get in the music business, you have to keep in mind, and this is this has always been the case, whether it was 50 years ago or it's now, you've got to have a thick skin, you've got to, you've got to remember everybody's going to tell you you can't do it, and you just have to go forward and say, I can do it, and you just do it and do it and do it and be willing to sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice. That still holds true. You know, uh, everything else has changed, all of the recording techniques have changed, all of the uh, music uh, outlets have changed, whether it be a, a record company or the internet or whatever it is now, it's all changed. But the one thing that has never changed is uh, the fact that you have to sacrifice and you have to really want it. Next up is my interview with Nils Lofgren, who beyond a solo career is both a member of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band and Neil Young's Crazy Horse. Nils released a new album this spring titled Blue with Lou, which featured six songs that he co-wrote with Lou Reed. We talked about Blue with Lou at the beginning and then moved along to his amazing multifaceted 50-plus year career in music. Blue with Lou is the new record, and I want to know how long you spent recording it or even writing it. It was near the uh, the end of the, uh, the river tour. We were in Australia actually doing kind of a last leg of what was a long river tour. Where I started writing in earnest. I did. I do have a notebook with ideas as I go and, and riffs that I'll compile. But I, um, that, it was about two years chipping away at it <clears throat> from the conception <clears throat> uh, to where we actually recorded it. Certainly, one of the goals was to get the uh, Lou Reed songs left behind because I, I always thought Lou might record those. But once we lost Lou, which was an awful loss to the to the planet and the musical community, I I thought, well, my next record has to include those songs nobody ever heard that we wrote. And I wanted to do my version of our uh, co-write City Lights, where uh, I just thought it was so great. Lou Lou narrated it, and I wanted to do it with the original melody. He did it on the Bells album. So anyway, those six co-writes and, uh, of course, six of my own, uh, I wrote a lot of songs. I had about 20 by the time we started recording it, but... One of the goals was to um, also be able to sing live in the studio and play the songs live, have nothing left to be written or organized, and uh, ban the click tracks. So we did, we just played in a room without baffles or ISO booths, looking at each other like kind of the olden days. So off and on, it was almost two years before I had about 20 songs, the six Lou Reed co-writes uh, included, that I was ready to... Uh, you know, sing and play them live, and I called my dear friends Andy Newmark on drums and Kevin McCormick on bass, explained what we were doing, and they came into the home for, you know, two or three weeks. Uh, Amy set up the home for a musical invasion and looked after us and fed us and, you know, kind of made us feel welcome and at home while we jumped into this project. So on and off, of course, I was doing other things and touring, but my focus was... It's so almost two years before I was ready to actually, you know, jump into it and uh, had everything ready to sing and play live, like about 20 songs. And these are the 12 that I, I felt, you know, would make a great album at the end of the day. So the fact that you had six songs that you'd worked on with Lou Reed just sitting there over the years, that kind of begs the question if there's a lot of unreleased and great stuff in your archive that one day still might come out. Well, um, you know, again, Lou used the song uh, City Lights on the Bells album, so that was one I wanted to re-record my own version. The other five got left behind, and of course, once we lost Lou, I knew it was had to be my job on my next album to, to share those. Uh, one of the things that happened, gosh, it's been, what, four or five years, uh, Fantasy Records 
kindly uh, put a 10-disc box set together called Face the Music. I'm very proud of it. It's my favorite release. There's a DVD and nine CDs. And they let me handpick the best of every record I ever made, going back to Grin. And uh, we included 40 bonus tracks. So there were 40 rarities, basement tapes, demos. I've got a lot left, of course, but, um, you know, that was really kind of a a watershed moment to handpick uh, my top favorites of uh, all unreleased material over the decades to share it. So that was kind of a good house cleaning that I shared on Face the Music. Another great project. Uh, Fantasy was wonderful. They had a lot of input, a lot of ideas, but uh, my wife Amy produced the packaging with their art departments who were great. Uh, An old friend, Steve Smolin, had all the old ephemera, the 45 sleeves, the old tickets, the old posters, something I never collected. So really proud of that, the Face the Music box set. But I, I did get to kind of share the cream of the crop of my outtakes there. So, you know, there's a few more here and there. And uh, all these songs on the new Face, um, I'm sorry, the new Lou, Blue with Lou album are, are things really more recently written. Now, I heard you talk a lot about Face the Music on Lynette Corolla's podcast. And she's obviously been a longtime fan of yours. And listening to her talk about your career with you, you know, hearing that you opened for Jimi Hendrix when I believe you were 19 years old. In a way, your career has kind of been like a Forrest Gump, you know, intellect aside, a Forrest Gump-like approach in that you've had an interesting, successful solo career, and then you've been playing with Crazy Horse again, and you've obviously played with Bruce and other people like that. But when did you realize that you could have a career in playing a club on a Tuesday night, a stadium on a, on a Wednesday night, a private gig on a Thursday night, et cetera, that as a freelancer, that it was going to be okay? Well, you know, a number of things come to mind with that question. Certainly, uh, I've been on the road 50 years last September professionally. And just like with this record, you know, you make records to share. So you get excited like a kid. You're hoping you have bigger success. I've never had a commercial hit. Uh, I still would like to have one because the goal is to reach people. Um, I'm very grateful. I'm coming up on a tour in May. It's been over 15 years that I played with a band, let alone the band that made the record. My brother Tommy's joining us and um, Andy Newmark and Kevin, who made the record, and Cindy Mizell, who sang all over it. But um, I love going to sing and play, and that continues on. But uh, way back when I was 18 years old, my first year on the road, I hit the road when I was 17, I was living in Topanga Canyon driving uh, with David Briggs, one of my great mentors and big brothers that was uh, Neil Young's producer, and that's how I met David. And we were driving to Neil's house working on the After the Gold Rush sessions. And I even remember then saying, wow, it's it's fun not to be the boss every day. And um, very young age, I realized if you're in someone else's band, you get to play, you know, rhythm, piano, sing harmonies, things that you might not do as the band leader. And I always uh, embraced an opportunity to be in another great band, take a break from being the boss and doing my own stuff. And I come back to my own music a bit refreshed and I, I think a little added excitement about it, having all those other chapters. That was just kind of a natural thing that I wove in and out of my whole career. Uh, Hey, maybe if Grin had had some massive hit records, we would have gotten, you know, wrapped up in that kind of production and work, and maybe I, I wouldn't have uh, been as open to. Uh, but I don't think so, you know. I mean, I, I think uh, even if I had hit records with Grin um, <clears throat> or my own solo career, I, I recognize at a young age that being in other great bands is good for me, and uh, the opportunities I've had with. You know, with with Ringo to to Bruce to Neil to Patty Scalfa's bands to Willie Nelson, uh, I mean, those are things I'd like to think I would still take and stay open to because it's good for my musical soul. So it's just kind of yeah, the Forrest Gump thing is not a bad analogy because I just kind of got in the habit of saying yes to things that felt good musically and didn't really ever look at it from a political point of view. Uh, like, oh, is this good or bad for my solo career? I mean, I, if it was if it was good for me as a human being and a musician, then the answer was yes. Well, having started all this as a teenager and 
been there through the different files of audio changing, you know, going from vinyl to CD to digital and just seeing every trend go back and forth. Did you ever come close to giving it up, you know, to moving on? Or did you just know that you were a music lifer from when you were a teenager? Yeah, no, I, I knew uh, I was a, a lifer musician. And early on, I discovered performing had some kind of therapeutic value to it in addition to I me. Mean, of course, you're being judged and you want a good grade and you want people want to come back and see you. But there was an override of some kind of a, you know, emotional musical healing in there of performing in front of people that I fell in love with. Otherwise, I, I'm sure I wouldn't be, be on the road for fi- into my 51st year on the road. I don't like leaving home anymore. I've um, got a wonderful wife and dog pack and it's it's hard to leave home, but it actually gives me a deeper gratitude and focus for the shows because that's the only reason I left home. So I'm I'm, I'm even a bit more engaged, if you will, because of that homesickness. When I walk out to play, I'm, it's a more valuable opportunity than I think it ever has been to walk out and sing and play for people. But no, I never thought of giving it up. I it was. Uh, in the mid '60s, we loved the Beatles and Hendrix and the Stones. That, you know, Stacksville, Motown, all of it. But nobody ever thought you could do that for a living. And one night, I saw uh, the Who and Jimi Hendrix experience in two different venues in Washington D.C. the same night, and um, was kind of possessed with. Uh, I left the building possessed with the notion I wanted to try to be a professional rock musician. It never occurred to me. You know, we played the top 40 and did all the British Invasion and the American counterparts and Stacksville, Motown, cover bands just for fun. Never occurred to me I could be a professional rock musician. And that night I, I was uncomfortably possessed and the possession remains. Seeing that you're able to go from being a solo artist to a sideman <clears throat> to just parts of all, all sorts of all-star projects, how far in advance do you know that you're booked? Do you know what your schedule looks like two years from now? No, never. I, I Look, things arise out of the blue. If I'm free to do them, I will. Um, you know, uh, last year I was getting ready to go to England for a month and um, do my acoustic duo show, which we put a, my last album, Face the Music, uh, UK Live. Uh, came out great with Greg Varlotta, who I've worked with for got at least 12, 13 years, fabulous local player here in Scottsdale. And I was gearing up for that, and out of the blue, um, Neil Young called, and they were putting out our Roxy show when we opened the Roxy on Sunset Strip all those years ago on the Tonight's a Night Tour in 73, I believe. Said, hey, any chance you can, you know, fill in for five shows with pretty much jump on board with little or no rehearsal? Um and do these shows to commemorate the Tonight's a Night show coming out on vinyl. Um, and, uh, you know, I cringed because I thought, oh, now the next question is when? Because, you know, I was leaving in 11 days for Europe. And um, I just made it under the wire. And I thought, man, you know, if I, I, I'm going to miss a production day in England, but this is doable if you want to do it. And Neil said, give me a day. I'll call you back tomorrow. And he called back and said, we're all in. Let's do it. And I was able to do those five shows with Crazy Horse for the first time in a long time. So it's kind of seat of your pants. I, I don't, you know, I plan my own tours, of course. I, right now I've got this May tour that I've been working on since as soon as I knew the record would be done to get out and promote it and play. And uh, right now the year's open. You know, I, I'm trying to spend more time at home with my family and Amy and help out because I've been missing in action half my life being a musician. So, you know, the rest of the year is kind of open. I mean, if nothing's happening, I may look at getting out acoustically and or maybe if the record has a lot of success, thanks to people like you spreading the word and people enjoy it, maybe the band can do another run this fall or winter or maybe I'll do an acoustic run, um, chip away at some more ideas. I have songs, just start making demos towards another record in a year or two, whatever. And, you know, once in a while, surprises happen and, uh, I know Bruce talked about not the E Street Band would be off this year. There's no plans, but of course I hope that fires up in the next year or so. But that's just a dream and a wish that I hope comes true. And meanwhile, uh, between helping Amy at home and enjoying, you know, my beautiful home, wife and dogs, uh, you know, 
the only things I really control are my own acoustic work or, and of course, another band run, depending on the success of the record. And if the phone rings and there's some good opportunity, hey, um, if I can, if it, if it fits into my family and my schedule, I'll, I'll usually say yes. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so in closing, any last words for the kids? Oh, just, you know, check my record out. Come see us play. I haven't toured with a band for over 15 years, and I can't even remember last time I toured with a band that I made the record with. And if you're young and excited about music, don't sign a, don't sign a deal. Just work on your craft and writing songs and performing. Get out and play for people. That's the uh, best advice I could give you. That's where you learn the most is in front of an audience. Even if it's a coffee house with 20 people, you still learn stuff about yourself and what you're doing that I don't feel I learn anywhere else but in front of the crowd. So, But, you know, try to enjoy it and, and keep your heart down in it and uh, don't sign your life away to a record company early on. Next up is my chat with Jacques Torres, who many people call Mr. Chocolate. Jacques Torres is not only a top chef and a chocolatier, I hope I said that okay, but also a popular judge on television, most recently appearing on the Netflix series Nailed It. We mostly focused on the creative end of his career during our chat. This is Jacques Torres, Jacques Torres Chocolates. Hey Jacques, how's it going there today? Everything is doing good. Uh, beautiful day. What's about you? Uh, no complaints here on Long Island. Uh, thank you very much for calling. What I first want to ask you about is how amazingly prolific your company is with coming out with new items for major holidays and special occasions. And I'm wondering how far in advance you work. For example, what holiday is your company currently working on designing products for right now? We, we are done with Mother's Day. And now we are starting the, the next big holiday, which is the end of the year. So Thanksgiving, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. Christmas is the big one. Yeah, doing research and development take a lot of time. We are not starting the product uh, production, but we, we, we want to do the look of the product, make the picture ready. So this way, when the holidays arrive, we, we know where we're going and we know what we're doing. And... You know, looking that you have these great products just in time for Easter, when exactly did you start doing Easter products and, you know, specialized holiday products? So usually we start producing Easter just after Valentine. Valentine hit, you know, the 14th of January, always, uh, February, pardon, always. And Easter never never hit on the same date. We, we have to, to look at uh, when Easter going to, to be. So this, this year, Easter was relatively late, so we was able to make all the production between Valentine uh, and Easter. And when exactly in your history as, as you know, Mr. Chocolate and all that, did you first start doing specialized or themed chocolates as opposed to just making great products? Um, first, thank you for the compliments. Um, you know, and, and, and second, we, I think from the beginning, we... As soon as the, the chocolate line was um, was set, we we start to make a special uh, Easter, special Valentine, and then after that we realize that we need to do collections because customers come back year after year, and uh, we we need to do new collections otherwise they will have always the same gift. So every year we we change the collection. This year the inspiration was uh, New York street arts or Brooklyn street arts. And um, we, we, we put the, the color of the graffiti left in those um, old warehouse in Brooklyn, you know, when people do graffiti and then with the time they go away, then they, they tag again and they go away, they tie again and they will go away. You have all those blend of beautiful pastel color. So that's, we went after that this year. And then some of the rabbit that we did, we tagged them with graffiti using bubble, bubble letters, using different techniques. And, um, you know, this paid tribute to Brooklyn and to Brooklyn artists and to Brooklyn street art. Well, that's very interesting. A lot of chefs, of course, are going to get their inspiration directly in the kitchen. But it sounds like culturally that you and your team took a big risk in looking at Brooklyn street art. Does a lot of inspiration usually come from music or pop culture? Or was this just a special idea and a special occasion? No, this was one of a, one of a kind and one in time. Um, it's, not, it's not something that... Uh, 
I look at all the time. But, you know, I'm, I'm like everyone. I'm driving and I'm looking around and I get inspired by different things. Can be, can be one of those beautiful cherry tree in bloom in spring. Can be a smell, you know, next to the water, you get the smell of, you know, whatever. And you say, oh, my God, you know, this, this is great. What can I do? How can I duplicate that with my chocolates? Or simply... Uh, taking the train, you know, a few months ago I take the train, and and before uh, coming back uh, to the uh, to the station in New York, um, close to the city, there is a lot of of graffiti walls and a lot of tags. Um, I think because it's a, it's a place where people can do that, and I, and I was looking at that, thinking, oh my God, you know, some of those graffitis are, are gorgeous, and then when I went to my store. Um, looking at those old um, warehouse building, and, and, and I try to tie the two together and say, you know, what can I do to duplicate this, this feeling of, of, of Brooklyn, of New York, of, um, of artistry, um, of history? And that's what we come up with. And another thing that I find very interesting about you is that your wife has also been successful in the world of chocolate. How is it that you're made, able to make it work so well in working with a spouse in the same industry? Because that's something that a lot of people struggle with. You know, my, my, uh, first, I have a wonderful wife. You know, it's, uh, um, it's, it's who she is. And um, she worked with me um, when, um, you know, years ago. She, she was the chef opening of my uh, store, uh, downtown Manhattan. And, uh, and then after that, you know, she went to, to, uh, to Los Angeles, where she's from, and, uh, and she opened her own uh, chocolate uh, store called Madame Chocolat in Beverly Hills. And uh, it was just a beautiful, beautiful store. And she, she put in it all the, the feminine that I cannot put into my store. And she really made this store really her. And it was very... I don't know how to, to express, but a very feminine uh, touch into that store. Beautiful chandelier and, and beautiful flowers and a very, very delicate chocolates and, and beautiful. So she, she was doing something completely different than what I was doing. So maybe this is the secret of working together. You don't do the same thing. And she was doing something very different. Uh, so another facet of your career is working on Nailed It. Uh, is it coming back for season three? Any idea? I'm not allowed to, to disclose exactly what's happening, but let's, let's say that I'm pretty convinced that we're going to have new season. That's what I can say. So, so I'm pretty convinced we will have new season. Let's say that. But it sounds like it's a project that you enjoy doing. Was that your first venture into television besides just a guest appearance here or there? No, actually in um, around 2000, I had uh, two years with PBS where I had my own show. So we did um, um, over, I think over 50 shows uh, with PBS. And then I went to TV Food Network and we have another 50 shows there with TV Food Network. So over a period of five years, I was, um, you know, every week on TV. Then I opened my own business. So I kind of get out of television and, and, uh, and focus on building Jack Torres chocolates. And just lately, you know, a few years ago, I was contacted by uh, Net, uh, the, pardon, Magical Health and, uh, and, and for uh, Netflix. And to do that show, uh, nailed it. And um, I was not sure uh, because I never want to work on um, reality TV. But this one was different. This reality TV was different. This reality TV was no drama. They promised me no drama, no crying, not making someone feel bad by, by you know, telling them how bad they are. Um, no ridiculous challenge where you have to bake in, with one hand or one feet, you know, no, nothing of that. So I agree. I said, you know, let's, let's, let's give it a shot. And, uh, and we shoot the first season. And that's when I meet Nicole. And Nicole is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful host. She's funny. She's very talented. She's very smart. She's fast. Um, I, have, I have the best time with her. And then the, the, what's happened is when you look at that show, you, you look at those, the people who are in the show and you're thinking, oh, my God, you know, how can they do so bad? But you know what? You get inspired to do better. It, it's very interesting. So through the advice that I give people, to the little advice and little 
bit of information that I give to the to that show. Kids love to see the show because because it's funny because you see people doing some crazy things, but also they get inspired. So they will talk to mom and say, "Mom, I, I want to do a cake. I want to work in the kitchen. I want to to help you with this or that." And they feel good because they know they will be they will do better. And that's what I love about this show is that I inspire people, I inspire kids to be in the kitchen. And that was very unexpected, but this is what is happening. Absolutely. And are you a fan of television besides doing reality TV like this? Or do you kind of just look at television as a work thing? I don't watch TV much. I have a a two-year an eight months little boy and a three weeks little girl. Um, so I never been a big, a big, you know, TV fan. I, I, I never spend too much time in front of a TV. I love to, to bike. I love to paint. I love to do other things. And now with the kids, I have, ele- I have even less time. So I don't watch TV so much, but, um, when something is interesting, some documentary, I love to look at them. So, so, you know, it's, it's something that, um, uh, that, that I don't watch so much, but, but shooting television, it's something that I enjoy. That's something uh, very interesting to me because maybe it's different than my day to day. And, uh, and again, you know, I know that I inspire people and that's what I love to do. And then what about music per se? Because music is something that you could have on in the background while you're actually working or while you're exercising. Has music been a big, big part of your life over the years? I would say not big, but always present. So it's not something that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, where I have a lot of knowledge and I know all the artists and, 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 and I'm very specific about that, but it, music always been present in my in my life and it's something that will relax me it's something that i will listen when i uh, when i bike when i use the you know my exercise uh, bicycling around uh, running i used to run i, I ran four time new york marathon and i used to listen to music you know what do you do when you run then you listen to music and that take you to another place to to a, to a more fun place maybe so Um, Yes, music always been present in my life and I I enjoy it. So in closing, uh, any last words for the kids? Because I I have new kids now, I always think about, you know, how to, what advice to to give. And it's too early for me to give my son some, some advice now, but, you know, for the future. And my guess is it's true that you can be and do whatever you want. You know, in America, we always tell kids, you can be wherever you want. But that come with... A price, meaning if, if you, depending where you put the bar, you're going to have to work pretty hard for it. So what I would tell kids is, yes, you can be whatever you want, but remember that you will have to work to be also whoever you want. And depending where you put the bar, it's, it's, it can be pretty, pretty challenging. But if you really want it, if you're really um, in love with something that you want to do, then yes, anything is possible. I just want kids to understand it doesn't come for free. It comes with a price, and most of the time the price is hard work. And if they, they do that, yes, they can do whatever they want. Um, that's, that will be my, my, my advice um, in life. Um, another advice will be do something that you love. I do something that I love. And going to work is relatively easy when, when you know that during the day you're going to do something that you love. I work very hard in my, in my life, but I also enjoy what I do. Last but not least is my conversation with 311 singer and guitarist Nick Hexham, who is calling in from Los Angeles. 311 will be on tour for its 20th consecutive summer this year, this time co-headlining big venues with the band Dirty Heads. Nick spoke about the future of 311, but also touched upon how and why 311 is still able to do things at such a high level. Hi, Darren. It's Nick Hexham. Hey, Nick. Thanks for calling. How's it going there? Real good. Am I getting you from L.A. today? Yes. I'm just uh, at home taking care of some odds and ends around the house and uh, enjoying a little time with the family before the mad rush of summer gets going. And how long have you known about the upcoming touring that you have going through Live Nation? I guess, you know, last year we had a real successful run of co-headlining with The Offspring and... 
we just, you know, made a, a great deal with them to do the entire tour. And now we, this year again, finding a awesome co-headliner that's perfect for, you know, summer music under the stars is uh, Dirty Heads. So, yeah, we've uh, had this plan for a few months and it's looking really good. Well, it's, it's been very interesting to me when a band transitions from being like a huge club band to becoming an amphitheater kind of act, which we, of course, 311 has been an amphitheater act for 15 to 20 years now. But what exactly was the jumping off point from being a band that has a couple of hits in the clubs to, you know, playing arenas and amphitheaters? Yeah. Um, I mean, we kind of have gone back and forth. I, I suppose it was around... I think it was, we called it the Transist Tour, which was our 97 tour where we had just had such a big smash with the song Down. And then then we followed up with the album Transistor. And then we took Incubus and Sugar Ray out on an on a amphitheater tour. Um, and then sometimes we, we decided to just scale back. Like we did the uh, club sound system tour, which even though we, we could have been playing amphitheaters we decided to, to to play clubs just to get back to that intimate feeling and then since then we've just kind of gone in and out of it where a couple summers ago we did more of a theater tour even though it was summer but you know we found some kind of smaller amphitheaters and stuff like that but um for me the, it's the more the merrier every extra heartbeat that's there you can kind of feel so i love having um bigger crowds keeping the ticket prices low just to have more more energy more people there well as somebody that's been following you since the mid 90s one of the more interesting things to me about 311 beyond you know the fact that you transitioned to amphitheaters is how you guys were among the first to do a lot of things you know beyond melding genres I would say you were one of the first bands to have a beer, like what you did with Amber Ale, and you were one of the first bands to have a cruise. And I'm wondering how much of that is organic versus how much of that is saying we want to be the first band to do X, Y, and Z. I would say it's more just um, organic excitement for different things, like for me to have our own cannabis line of products. That's been something that about five years ago when e-cigarettes first started coming around, I was like, whoever gets this right is just, it's just such a better way, you know, um, to, to use cannabis is to, to vape it. So having our own display, it's just, they're just like different passion projects. And then 311 Day, of course, we're not only the one of the first, but one of the only bands to kind of have a convention, you know what I mean? Um, to have 311 Day. And that just happened because our name happened to mean a date. And then we had a show booked in New Orleans and we said, let's call it 311 Day because it's on March 11th. And then, and we, and we said, we'll play three hours and 11 minutes. And then after that, we just had to keep topping ourselves over and over again to make it bigger in some way, more songs, more nights, whatever it was. And, um, so it really just came from, you know, rock and roll fantasies, you know what I mean? Our, our rock and roll dreams. You just made a good point about, you know, having a very unique name. And I remember when you were on David Letterman 20 ish years ago and the announcer called you 311. I'm curious when that kind of stopped, when people realized your name. Yeah, you know, I guess there, it did take people a minute to get used to and they would be like, um, 311, does that have anything to do with 711? Ha ha ha. You know, just like, making some stupid jokes or yeah, people would say three, one, one, or I remember the time poor Ed McMahon, when he was, he was really old and he was on the Carson Daly show with us the same night. And he goes out to introduce, introduce us. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, three LW, which was, he got confused with this uh, R and B group called three little women, three right. LW. And, and he, in front of the whole crowd, everybody just started booing him. I felt so bad for old Ed McMahon out there getting our name wrong. He was like, well, I've had the pleasure of introducing 3LW before, and I just got a little confused. Please bear with me. <laughs> right. That, that's definitely a memorable experience there, but I'm sure that was painful at the time. <laughs> it was. Um, but it was packed with our fans, so we all just had a good laugh with it. Um, but, yeah, it seems like, we weren't the first band to use a new numeric name, but there, we were kind of early on that. But there were other bands like right before us, like 24-7 Spies and Third Base 
And then it seems like there was kind of a bunch after us. I think it was a bit of a 90s thing to have numbers. Right. Now, beyond this summer tour that you have, how far is the future planned ahead for, for 311 or even yourself? You know, we are enjoying it and we still have a hunger in us. And I really think that keeping our approach grassroots where we do a lot of stuff ourselves and it's, um, you know, we can we keep a low profile, but that also we, we have kind of a hunger where we're, we're still ambitious and we still want to get new stuff done. We're not in like a coasting retirement kind of phase at all. So as long as that kind of passion exists, um, then we're going to keep doing it. And we are, we are very excited for this new album, like really excited. I think we kicked open a new door on Mosaic with some new styles and mod- more modern production techniques and just different influences and, um, you know, bringing in a, a other people to work with on the songs. It really is uh, made for a high morale and a lot of excitement. So, Therefore, to have a new tour with a new album gives us a whole new spring in our step. And you guys are still, from what I can tell, doing like two and a half hour live shows. I'm curious if there is like a band fitness regimen or something, because the fact that you guys are all still in shape and at a top level, most bands are just not doing that like 311 is. Yeah, you do have to think of yourself as an athlete. Um, you know, and I've, I've tried to you know, watch documentaries and read books about people like Mick Jagger, like, what does he do? Oh, he's got a, you know, a trainer that helps him stretch out and get really limber and warmed up before he gets out there. And, you know, he does like light weights and stuff like that. So I think of myself as an athlete and I know that I need to have my, my engine running when I get out there and be, be in good shape. Like I just got done. I like to just do kind of a mixture between cardio and I do everything to the beat because to me being a musician, if when you do stuff to a beat, it it's more like dancing rather than work. So when I'm on the elliptical, I'm cranking to, I have playlists that are in a certain tempo depending on what I'm doing. And, and I'm, and I'm always doing it to the beat and then setting the resistance just right to have my heart rate up at like 160 for 30 minutes. Like I just did that this morning and then I moved over to weights and, and then I do some abs. So that's like a typical thing that I'll do pretty much every other day. And then I also have like a couple basketball games. I'm, I'm in two different leagues and I like to surf. Um, so yeah, it's a big part of my life. But when I, earlier in life, I decided, I realized that when I worked out, it was like it helped my brain be more relaxed and that I felt too antsy and somewhat crazy, stir crazy if I don't work out. So it was almost more of a, a mental help for me than the physical side of it. But now I just turned 49 years old and the fact that I can school people half my age on the basketball court feels pretty good. And do, do you have a favorite team in the NBA? Because unfortunately, growing up in Nebraska, you only had college sports. Yeah, um, I'm just a big sports fan in general. I like to place small wagers on bets, so I'm kind of like a fickle, fair-weather um, fan. I mean, I was uh, a big L.A. Kings fan, and I happened to have season tickets the year that they won the Stanley Cup and was there. So that was probably my biggest fan boy sports experience. Um, but right now, I'm putting small bets on, on hockey and basketball and um, love to see the Warriors just the way they're they're they work so well together. You know what I mean? Like to me, that the strength in numbers philosophy is uh, like to see that on screen and kind of the way we work in our band. I have a lot of respect for that. Right on. Uh, so, in closing, any last words for the kids? Man, we are just so grateful to fans that supported our rock and roll dreams as we get close to our thirtieth year. It's just. Uh, so thankful to our fans to to let us do something that we would be doing as a hobby, as a career. So thank you to all of them. Looking forward to seeing New York soon, Nick. Thank you. Uh, all right. I appreciate it, Darren. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Paltrowcast with Darren Paltrowitz on the Pure Grain Audio Network. 
More information on the Paltrowcast can be found online at www.puregrainaudio.com. Until next time, have a great Shabbos. Mm-hmm.